Okay, so I would like to introduce the uh, people who are responsible for this movie, at least four of them, of the few hundred that actually worked to get this done for all of us. So first, I'm, I'm going to start with uh, Matt Baer. Matt, are you there? Come on, come on down, Matt. Matt is the visual effects supervisor. Uh, also, I just I, I like to tell a little bit about everybody. Uh, Matt joined PDI DreamWorks back that was many years ago, and he started as the clothing artist, which is not a real title. Matt, you want the story behind the yeah, title? Yeah, please. That was actually part of the effects department. Uh, clothing and crowds, everything was under effects. And there was four of us sitting with all the animators doing all the clothing on Shrek 1. And I think it was the simple answer for why our, that was our title was they offered us to be part of the effects department or clothing artists. And all of us looked around, the four of us, and we said, will our parents be able to find our names easier in the credits? Yes. Cloth artists. <laughs> It's not Pretty a real simple. title. I, it was really just so our parents could get yeah, the credits. So they could, your parents could. Uh, now, I'm, I'm, next person I'm going to uh, introduce is Catherine DeVries, a story artist on the show. Catherine? <laughs> Where are you, Catherine? I know she's here. Here she comes. Hi, Catherine. It's OK. Catherine uh, did a lot of work before. This is only your second feature, a story on a feature, right? The, before that, sit down, sit down. Um, before that, you uh, were a story artist on a lot of TV. I was. I'm going to ask you a question about that, but not yet. All right. Catherine, by the way, her parents, um, she was raised by wolves in, uh, I think it was Nova Scotia, right? Is that correct? Close. Good. Ontario. <laughs> Ontario. Uh, and then I want to introduce J.P. Sons. J.P. <laughs> Head of character animation on this show. Hi, J.P. Come and sit down. I happen to know what the JP stands for, but I don't want to release it unless he says so. So JP. Jurassic Park. What's that? Jurassic Park. Jurassic Park. Jurassic Park songs. Uh, and I've uh, worked on a lot of things. And also uh, co-directed with the person I'm going to introduce next, which is Pierre Perifal, the uh, director of the show. Pierre. Uh, I was the, one of the only guys, Everybody. I was at DreamWorks for a long time myself, and when I looked at the credits this time, I said, I don't know anybody. No, it's it's so changed. But Pierre was there when I was there. For the last, you, you started, it's about the time I was leaving, I think. Yeah. So it's been, a, it's been a long time. Um, and, and the two of you worked on a, on a short together. We uh, did. Which one was it? There'll be. There's not that many, man. I know. <laughs> uh, but I wanted you to say it. Um, and, and so you're old pals, but all of you have worked together before, I think. You've all, you've all worked in this, on, yeah, the, on the show together. I think Catherine is the, uh, is the emerging, rising star, <laughs> but she joined us just for that, guys. What I'm going to generally do is I'll ask a few questions that I think maybe you guys are interested in and you guys can answer, and then I'm going to open it up to, um, to all of you. It's going to be hard to see you guys in the back if you raise your hand, so you've you got to make, like, be really big so we can see it, so I can call on you. But I'm going to start with this. First of all, the, the look of the film is a little different than, than some of the other DreamWorks films. And I think that was on purpose. I think you guys took some inspiration from other places and, and, uh, and decided to make it look different. So how, would, how did that work? How did that decision come about? Um, may I take this one? Yeah, I think it's been, it's been something that uh, we've all kind of wanted for a while. Definitely, I did want that for for a long time. Just seeing something a little bit different from the uh, the classic beaten path that we see in CG animation. You know, we see we tend to see very often uh, the same kind of character designs, or or you know the the way the eyes are rendered, or even the the the, the, the way the the light bounces around, and how kind of realistic rendering we do have, which is awesome. And by the way, CG has done such made such big strides, you know, in the last 10 years or so. So it's always looking fantastic. But I think, and even if at DreamWorks we don't have an home house, you know, style, um, the idea was can we get 
to some towards something that's a bit more illustrated, a bit more stylized, a bit more. And, and I really draw from some inspiration from you know where I come from in from France. You know we have a also a big big uh, animation industry over there. And you were Goblin's graduate? Did you graduate? Yeah, yeah. Goblin's yeah. uh, animation school in Paris. Yeah, and uh, and by the way, these guys do amazing uh, short films as well, which are like always a great inspiration to draw from. Um, and then and then in France also it's kind of kind of that that place is kind of interesting because there is such a big cross pollination between the French, um, you know, graphic novel and, and, and cinema and animation and Japanese inspiration as well. It's like we, we had mangas when I was growing up and it's arriving, like mangas and animes, and it's arriving here much, much, much later in a way to be available to everybody, you know, thanks to streaming platforms and stuff. But, um, you know, when we were quite young, you know, it was on TV all the time. So I think we grew up, uh, definitely I grew up with this and I wanted to see that for a while. And yeah, and, 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 and Spider-Verse happened and kind of opened the, the door to, you know, us trying new stuff and, and, and CG, you know, big productions kind of evolving in a bit, which, you know, it's, it's great. I think it's amazing, you know. JP, since you were uh, head of character animation on that and you had a slightly different, I'm calling it a 2D, 3D style to it. We'll That's, take it. I, I, I coined that myself. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> uh, was that a different way to, to uh, do the animation? Yeah, absolutely. Um, like Pierre, by the way, JP is Juan Pablo. Yeah. I feel guilty not answering that. <laughs> there you go. Um, uh, I think from the beginning, again, like Pierre said, we don't have a house style DreamWorks, which is what I love about it. And this one gave us another opportunity to kind of push the medium and see which direction do we want to go. And at the very beginning, we had many conversations. And you handed me some Dragon Ball Z comic books. And they were amazing. And I was like, you know, what if we do something stylized, very graphic, very 2D, but let's not mimic 2D. You know, I think at the beginning, our target was kind of always moving, but it was getting smaller and smaller. We were figuring it out as we were going. We were driving the car as we were building it. And, you know, seeing the art and designs and everything that the story was bringing, we started going into the 2D aspect of it more, making more graphic style by just removing some kind of images. And in a way, the computer does a lot of in-betweens for you. And it's for us was, how do we remove that aspect of it? So it's getting, a, get, getting rid of the information that the CG gives you so we can keep more of that 2D feel. So we try to go in between. You know, We had a lot of inspiration for like Miyazaki's and, and French animation that, that we looked at. Uh, also, I, I, n I noticed you had very anime-like teeth. Yes. They, the teeth change. As uh, depending on the on their uh, on their uh, emotional state. Yeah, we learned that really, uh, you know, like even for Bilby and the bird and everything. Like we um, we need teeth to emote, and Snake and Marmalade, all these characters didn't have human teeth. And when you want to do shapes like E or anger, you can't just do it with two fangs. So we just said, let's do a bunch of teeth. So through the film, you'll see like the characters have fangs and then zigzags and then human teeth and plated teeth. Like we're just cheating everything. It's perfectly fine. It's a, it's a, it's animation. You can do that. Exactly. Speaking of animation, now, uh, Catherine, you worked in a lot of TV shows, things like that, and then suddenly you're in. I think the first feature you did, I've, I've forgotten which one it was, but it was. Uh, oh, I think it was the spies. You know, the spies yeah, picture. I jumped in spies in disguise for a bit right. for Blue Sky. And then there's this picture, which is pretty different. Um, what is the, what what did you find? Uh, first of all, which did you prefer? I'm going to put you on the spot <laughs> there. <laughs> um, I love feature. Um, I love it um, because. It's it's a totally different approach because in TV you know there's no there's not really time for negotiation or debate once you put down your boards it's kind of like all right that's it if it works it's going into production with feature there's so much more time to iterate and so much more time to try things out and try ideas out and throw it out in the end um, but you get to try out so much stuff and experiment so much and it's really rewarding to to see it go through. There's a secret I just want to ask you. Was there a sequence you did that you really loved that got struck out? Because Pierre's kind of a tough guy. <laughs> oh. He's the worst. Yeah, look at him. <laughs> By the way, you may have noticed Pierre is from New York. You can tell from his accent. Um, <laughs> any, anyway, no, that's, that's a good answer. So you have the time. Oh, yeah. 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 No, there, and there was no sequence that I did that I missed when it, if it got lost or any gag or anything. I think um, what ended up in the movie was the best version of the movie. And um, there's quite a lot in there that I loved that stuck through into the end. So um, it's, it's awesome to see it survive. Because we go through story for like years. 
we iterate on these sequences and the gags and what lines make it in and what gags make it in and sometimes things get in and get lifted and come back a year later. Um, so it's, it's so fun to see what made it in. Did you, uh, did you storyboard the fart parts? No. Oh. <laughs> for, for that the, wasn't me. For the, for the story, um, that first heist in the museum, um, so the idea was to make a heist like Christian and Levenstein, right? And, uh, and we arrive in the script, we arrive to this, but it's so incredibly difficult to write this. And I go to Catherine and Matt, Matt Flynn, who's a uh, story lead on the, on the team, and I'm like, you guys, this is uh, what we're trying to do, just make it great and fun. They, so they went away for like, I don't know, three weeks or so, or two weeks, she started writing, and, and they came back with basically what you see on screen. You know, they get in the museum and they just split up and they all have their flask. And when, when you pitched it to us, I swear, you know, we were rolling on the floor laughing. You came up with the idea of just shock. I'm having a baby and all this. You couldn't stop laughing. It was so good. <laughs> and so this basically what, ha you know, it's basically un un untouched what, what you have on screen and just animated and everything. But what she, what she did is like exactly what, what you see, basically. You know? That's another issue with, with uh, TV. Oftentimes you don't get to pitch things. You just do the boards, you know, and get them done. And then this, so you pitched pretty well, huh? Yeah, pitching, we pitched that sequence over and over <laughs> to all <laughs> kinds of people. Um, and it was really so fun. Good. It was really fun. Now, I'm not leaving Matt out because you had the, the vi this, uh, visual effects of, a, of the show. I noticed in the crawls, and it's been lately that in a lot of films, there's more people working visual effects than anything else. It's this giant crew, it seems to be. Or at least that's the way the, the crawls work out. How big was the crew, and uh, did you have to crack the whip a lot, or did everybody just have a lot of fun? We did not have to crack the whip, especially with Pierre. I mean, uh, just like Story, he was open to anybody pitching ideas back, which was great. And then always trying to just recenter us every once in a while, but for the most part, just here's the goalpost, here's the basic recipe everybody had that way. As far as the size of the crew, to me, when I see those credits, those are small departments. Each department was on, and pretty lean teams. If you really, if you if you look at the size of those compared to other films that we've done, and that allowed us to really have this really senior level team doing a ton of work, which was which was great. I think it may be the way IMDb or somebody breaks these things out because it, it's character animation, and then everybody else is somehow, all the other artists are somehow in visual effects, even yeah. if they're mm. yeah. I think that's how they do it. At some point on IMDb, we had Glenn Keane, we had Brad Bird, whatever. <laughs> Somebody credited the all-star animation team now, on this um, movie. That was me putting it in. Now, there's a, there's, a, and I, there's a ton of them. There's a ton of Easter eggs in this thing. First of all, you're in L.A., so it's an L.A. town, super L.A. And, there, and I, I couldn't get them all. I just knew they were going by, and I was missing them. You know, there's like, first of all, there's, there's, there's landmarks I could tell. There's the bank at, La at Laurel Canyon and, and Ventura. Yep. There's, uh, there's uh, Dorothy Chandler. Yep. There's the Children's Hospital, which I think you guys made up. It doesn't look exactly like the Children's <laughs> Hospital here, but it was a Children's Hospital. Um, so Pasadena Bridge. There's a work boot, work boot warehouse sign. There's a, a whole bunch of stuff. So you, and, and there's other things that the characters do. You take the fingerprint of, of, of Snake with his tail. <laughs> so, so how many, how many, how did you just, here's a place to put an Easter egg. Did you guys do it that way? So the idea from the, the beginning and what I, I pitched Luke, because Luke DeMarchelier, who's a production designer, was uh, one of the very first uh, member of the, of the crew, really, because we started together on this. But the, the first mandate I was giving him is like, any drawing we do, any, any shot we do, we need to, uh, when we do it, we need to laugh at it. We need, we need to be able to not take ourselves too seriously. And this is why I think there's so many little details like this that just make us giggle. And that was the, the goal. And, and you know, if you watch it many times, you're going to pick up on those. Uh, you don't see everything in the first, first viewing, obviously. But, uh, but that's the idea, was like just peppering in like, like small little things that make us smile. I want to know this, because I took this down. Who was born on October 19th, 1991? And who was born on July 2nd, 1965? Because those are the dates of birth of Wolf and Snake. I know that because it says it right in the movie. Yeah, that's right, that's right. <laughs> who was born, was it, did you pick anybody or was it just like, you know? I do believe, and that's a question for Luke, I think. Uh, I do believe it's, uh, it's one of the, uh, it's, it's two birth, the birth dates from uh, artists in the art department. I wouldn't be able to tell you <laughs> who exactly, right. uh, because I don't know it. 
Um, but I, I'm pretty sure it's yeah, it's like Thursday from the people from the team. And you'll see on the on the on the walls in the streets all those graffitis of like names of the crew. Yeah, I would figure that's what animators like to do. Um, there's a whole bunch of different effects in this. There's a you know the explosions, the, the, the sound wave that goes about when the, when things happen, and there's the fart. The fart, the fart is the first fart is six minutes and a half into the movie. I just want you to know I timed it. <laughs> but the fart, or the gas passing, if you want to be delicate, is part of the plot. Usually it's just a gag, and of course and it's funny. It's been funny since the Greeks, but. Um, but, but in this case, there's a, there's a part. There's a, a plot point to it. You, you, you set it up and you pay it off near the end. Um, was that an easy effect, Matt? You're asking, is an explosion harder than a fart? Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes, especially if there's, if there's a story point to yeah. it. So timing becomes extremely <laughs> important. Um, we used to, coming up through effects, we used to always see that those effects were going to be in the film, and most of us would kind of vie to see how do we get that shot. Like to be able to work on some, an effect that's funny is pretty rare. Um, but they do become pretty challenging. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the fart that goes to the vent, I don't know how many times uh, we worked on that for a while. <laughs> the, the motion is so fast and you're trying to get it to read like it's moving. And you know, like JP's team, we're really cutting out a lot of in-between motion. Right. But at the same time, trying to sell speed and what the heck that thing's doing when it's going down that I just love right. the image of people in DreamWorks for an hour figuring out how the fart should look. And yeah, yeah, many meetings. <laughs> I mean, We're pretty eight, proud of it. That's our job. Eighty percent of the discussion making this movie was about fart. Really? <laughs> well, there you go, folks. This is something that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you if you guys have questions, I'd like to you raise your hand, and I will do like this and try and see you. But in the back, p past the lights, it's going to be hard to do. So raise your hand, and, and I'll call on you. There's a, a question right up here with this guy that has a really good jacket. Go ahead. Really loud, though. So I have to ask, with uh, Professor Marmalade, which is a guinea pig, and he controls these other guinea pigs who are in cages and unable to talk and not in clothes, is it like a uh, goofy uh, Pluto situation where some can talk, some don't, and some animals evolved, and some didn't? What do you Pierre? It is very goofy. No, I mean, the, and don't necessarily want to spoil much more, but if you've read the books, um, if you have, you know that Marmalade is not a guinea pig. Ah, yeah. So we're playing with that ambiguity at the moment. Okay. But again, that's, uh, that's for uh, future occurrences if that happens too. MB, go ahead, really loud. Question in case you didn't hear, it's about asking about the music. So when, when I pitched the film for the first time um, as a concept, the, the music from the beginning was uh, part of that pitch. Uh, because, because seeing, the, seeing the, the first draft of the script and seeing the, the, the first book from Aaron, you know, it was, you know, and I, I, we kind of I've, I've talked at length about it, but it, 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 it has, it's super reminiscing of the Tarantino filmmaking, it's Scorsese filmmaking. And, and to me, it was like obvious, you know, that it was Reservoir Dogs and Snatch and Ocean Eleven, and obviously in these movies, the, the, the soundtrack is incredibly specific. Uh, and for for Tarantino specifically, you know what he does, and Gary does that to an extent. But for him, you know, he doesn't really have a score. He really gathers a bunch of songs. He's incredibly just gifted at you know, you know, music recognition and whatever. You know, he has all that library. That the point was, what if we use, instead of doing a score, what if we use um, songs? Um, and so I, it kind of was the idea from the very beginning, you know, we have a specific style that's different from what we see before. We are playing in a genre, we're, we're homaging that genre. And also, musically speaking, I wanted something that felt like Tarantino, right? Um, and the first name that came up for as a composer was Daniel Pemberton. Uh, and uh, I pitched him the film, and he's like, Wow, I love this. I love that idea. And just he was immediately on board. Um, but he was like, this is going to be difficult to do without a score. But I love the idea. I love the intent. And so, obviously, him being Daniel and he's incredible, um, trusted him right away. And he came back really quickly with what he felt would be kind of a great support for the, for the tone of this film. And he came back with four or five um, demo tracks, you know, and all of them were like spot on right away. 
um, because he's such a magician and it's so able, so, so versatile, able just to, 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 to go from genre of music to another one so easily. Um, and so that's how it happened, but the intent from the beginning was to try and just get that feeling of heist, caper, action. Um, at first it was supposed to be just music and needle drops and then slowly it evolved into having a score because we needed an emotional support and we didn't know all this. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, that, that music, that score is absolutely incredible. If you listen to it, you know, on the platform, Spotify, whatever, you'll see how complex it is and how incredibly well crafted that, 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 that guy has made it, you know. He's, abs he's, he's a genius, he's really, really impressive, really, you know, um, focused and, and so talented, so talented. Um, I'm, I'm gonna follow up on a question, because the question you, you had was interesting. There is a, um, there's, a there's a logic to this that uh, I, I'd like to hear you guys talk about. You have animals that are the main characters, and then there are, everybody else is a human. Except the two other two main characters, the reporter and, and the police chief, are human. But everybody else is human, and yet somehow that's perfectly okay in this world. Did the, now that may have been set up by the books. I I don't know. No. But did you guys must have talked about that, and it must have really affected the story. Barely. No. <laughs> <laughs> what is the logic? Um, and, and I'm kind of monopolizing the conversation. If you guys want to jump in, jump in. Um, well, no, of course, we've talked at length about it. For me, it was, you know, uh, always, first of all, I love that we're not explaining it, even though we do have a logic. And people go along with the right, you know, they don't, they don't actually question it. The books are not that, the books are all animal world. But I didn't want it to feel like it's a, um, it's, um, we were quickly gonna fall into the Zootopia land where these guys are predators and the rest of the, 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 the cities you know, praise, um, and it was not supposed to be that because the message is really about our fears and our, our our terror of these scary animals that we are afraid of with no reason necessarily. You know, and we write stories about them. And uh, what I tend to say is like, what? How would a giraffe react to piranha? You know, there is no fear there, and so it, it was all in our psyche as humans just to see and and, be, and and our phobias of these animals. So therefore, we had to give, we have to make, we had to make the rest of the world kind of a a human world, being able to just be afraid of these scary animals that we, we wrote, again, we write story about them and we're you know, scared of them for sometimes not, not real um, uh, reasons or not valid reasons. Um, so this is why we did that, that, um, that, uh, that blended world. Um, and then same thing, you know, for, for what's his face, uh, Marmalade, um, he's, he's representing cute, he's representing goodness. Um, and, and misjudged also because of that. He's, he's clearly ma uh, wearing a mask. And Diane is also an, a former villain, so all bad guys. Well, one of your uh, executive producers was the writer of the book, yep. Aaron Blaley. Blaby. Blaby. And, and it, since the books are all, they're all animals, what did he think about this split? So he was involved from the beginning, really. He was, uh, he was, uh, we, we've always kept him you know, in, the, in the loop. And he's been incredibly generous of letting us explore, you know, the way we wanted to explore, just start the, the story before his first book. You know, we also changed, you know, uh, Tarantula's gender. Um, and he's always been incredibly supportive and to let us do it as long as it, that the characters were true to what he wrote. Um, he was fi fine basically with, with anything. And the, the tone would be the, the right tone and following the, the tone of the books. And so, no, he never had really any big, big, you know, red flags. Um, we are incredible. You're lucky. Very. You had a question right here in the front? Yes. Uh, how did COVID play into the production? Like, was this largely done at home over Zoom, or was there any in-building production? The question is, how did COVID, this is the common question nowadays, how did COVID affect the production? No impact whatsoever. <laughs> I think four months into pre-production, we all went home. And I think, like everyone, we had no idea what was going to happen. We didn't know if we were going to return to work. I mean, it was, but we still had to work on the movie. And for a lot of us, I think COVID had major, <laughs> you know, challenges. Whatever your life situation is at home or work or, and um, I, I sorry, I took this question real no, quick, but it was it was um, there was obviously very a, a lot of challenges with COVID. There's something very unique that happened because of COVID, where because we all were working from home and trying to figure out how to do this and trying to balance our lives with work, 
in some weird way, we were working with people, seeing their lives in a different way. We weren't going to work nine to five and just, this is work and this is work nine to five, that's it, bye. And then, you know, we would be talking to Pierre and there's his living room and then talking to someone and their kid is like slapping him on the face. <laughs> and these, this became normal, you know? And, it, and it, was, it was a unique experience where it felt more like we were closer together because we were able to see in each other's lives the, and embrace like brought it. a humanity to it, right? Like Absolutely. Like JP's son, who's here, would come to dailies all the time, and you'd see, you know, parents with their kids at dailies, and it, it really kind of brought a lot more empathy to the crew. Yeah. I will say we adapted a lot to it. At Probably at most, we had 10 people on campus at any given time throughout the two years. Uh, but a lot of our workflows were almost designed so if one department started having some sort of who knows what was happening at home, if they needed to slow down or shift things around, other departments could kind of sweep in to do some additional work. And so almost all the workflows were these little tiny modular pieces that allowed, like if JP's team got busy, another team could swoop in and help out and vice versa. Mm. So I, I would say like it really kind of leveled everything out and really kind of built a new way of managing the teams, a much more empathetic way of managing teams. I think um, what was fortunate for us in story is that we started sort of because we're the you know first on in the process. We started a little bit earlier than all these other departments, and so we did have a few months. We had six or eight months, I think, in studio before we all got sent home, and um, that time was really valuable. I think just because we were all in the office, we were sharing you know sharing spaces and sharing offices, and felt like we could drop by each other's offices and just pitch things or talk about, you know, there's this idea I'm working on, what do you think of this? And what, could we pitch this to Pierre? And what, how can we kind of solve these problems? And there was a lot of like, those kind of hallway discussions that you don't get when you have to then set a Zoom meeting to do it. So that was super, super helpful, I think, to have that um, camaraderie early on and the accessibility of the whole story team and Pierre and Damon and um, being able to kind of Think about the movie in those casual, you know, conversations, because you we, things would pop up that we, you know, would never get if we had to only save it for, you know, the one meeting of the week or whatever. Um, so that was super valuable, and then we carried on that, um, you know, that spirit into virtual, um, and you know, kept having coffees and you know, team meetings and things just to talk things over, um, and I, it was. Uh, it was so lucky that we got that time in office before being sent home, I think. What, what, how's pitching different in, live and on, a, and on a little screen? How, how did that work? It's very different. It <laughs> is tough because you can't read the room at all um, because everyone, the first thing everyone does in a virtual pitch is like, all right, we're going to like mute and turn off our videos now. And then you're like, is anyone watching me? Oh. Watch this? Like, I don't know if they're laughing. I don't know. Is this going well or not? I don't know. Um, whereas in, you know, when you're doing it in the room, you can kind of feel the energy. You can see people smiling or you can hear them laughing and you can feel, oh, okay, this is going over really well. Um, but virtually you have to wait and be like, <laughs> is it good? What, what do you think? That, that's the biggest drawback from uh, from working from home in, in on WebEx or Zoom or whatever. Um, even even when we are doing a screening, so we have screenings every what three months, um, and everybody gets sent a link, and you watch it at home by yourself yeah. in your misery, you know, and <laughs> 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 waiting to hear from your friends. Was it good? Because like. <laughs> As opposed to being in a theater like this and just uh, like feeling the room and, 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 and hearing people's reaction to, uh, to a screening like uh, that is partial, uh, that's some, you know, of course, because we eat um, it. So that was, that was the, for me, was the hardest part. Well, animation was, I mean, we go to dailies and it's, we read the room like you're saying and we, we, we test a lot of stuff as animators. We test this like, all right, I'm gonna try something, let's see if it gets a laugh and let's see if it works. You go to dailies, everybody's watching the shot for the first time, and you get laughs, and that's confirmation. It's like, okay, I'm on the right direction. There might be notes, but you're onto something. We couldn't do that anymore. We just had to trust that it would work or not, or that Pierre would tell us that it was working, because he would show something funny, and I'm laughing by myself, <laughs> like hysterically, but there's obviously no sound, and I'm like looking at little, like, by the way, they're like, the pictures are like this, right? So you're like, is anybody laughing? Anybody laughing? Anybody laughing? And then we just have to wait until you meet yourself and be like, <laughs> and that's all we hear, and we're like, all right, it's working. That's good. I have a question over here, um, right up near the, uh, before you, uh, right behind you, 
is somebody who had their hand up for a long time. So stand up really loud. So what, what books is it which based ones, on? Yeah, which which ones? Bad Great question. Uh, so as, as you know, if you read the books, the story starts before in the books. The um, the first very first few pages of the books, Mr. Wolf, the big bad wolf, is talking to the audience, uh, to the reader, and is basically saying, uh, gathering their crew and saying, guys, we're going to go good. So that's how it starts. And you get it immediately because he's the big bad wolf and you understand why where he's coming from. But uh, we, I think, for the movie, we really wanted to do a little bit of a uh, kind of a prequel to this moment and what led those characters to be uh, to, 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 to make that decision, right? Um, so we're not following one specific book in terms of, you know, the storyline. We're, we're mostly creating our own storyline, but taking some very key moments or, you know, uh, iconic moments from the books. And really it's in the four, first four books, I think, you know, three, four books. Uh, where you have, you know, when they save the guinea pigs and literally what, what they do in the books where they're saving uh, s dogs and chickens and then there's the, the, the saving the cat from the tree. And there's many moments that we just stole from the, from the books, def definitely. But borrowed. Borrowed. <laughs> Bor actually, yeah, Adapted. we own those books. <laughs> I had a question, right? yeah, there you go. Uh, no, it was, uh, one of you guys asked a question. The question, in case you didn't hear it, is the challenging part of finding the style. I think based on all the inspirations that we had, we didn't want to mimic something else that you've seen as well. We didn't want to recreate something that you've seen. We wanted to create something unique. But at the same time, you have to cater to the story. Um, and again, because that moving target was constantly moving, it was, that was the biggest challenge, I think, for me at the beginning, was find a style that isn't just cool for me as an animator, but also caters to the story and serves the purpose of, of what the, the theme and the story we're trying to tell. And, and for us, I think, you know, we, we coined uh, sophisticated stupid was, <laughs> was something that we're like, we don't take ourselves seriously. The story has heart and emotion, but also it's like, ah, you're supposed to laugh too. We're not, you know, there's, they're writing on top of guinea pigs in the air. So um, <laughs> for the style for us was, again, going from Miyazaki and, Japanese animation and then seeing everything new that we've seen and then how do we remove information enough to, f to feel graphic and kind of like a comic book in motion, but not too much where it's just jarring to the eye. You know, because again, because it's still emotional, we, we still want to read their emotions, their, their expressions, because you know, the, the emotion is what carries through the film. So it, it was a, a tricky balance. Yeah, I think it's also, you know, because both in terms of the animation style and motion style and VFX as well, uh, and the overall look, by the way. Uh, it's something that is fresh is something that people are not trained to do also. And so it was like getting the, the right reference, getting to guide the team so that they understand what the target is. And if I'm taking the example of animation, for instance, you know, it's in the, in the recent, most recent uh, movies or like in the latest films, it's like it's been a lot of evolving towards a bit more realistic type of animation where you use a lot of video reference. And, and the point was, okay, this is, uh, you know, I'm gonna show you Ernest and Celestine, I'm gonna show you, you know, Lupin, okay, sort of Carioso and all these references, try to do this, but people are not necessarily versed into that language. Uh, and so it was like a bit of a training that JP had to do with the team um, and to, to kind of teach them a little bit, how do you do this stuff? How do you, you know, what kind of posing does that imply? I mean, there's so much, so much going on there. Oh, you use Lupin as well. Oh, Absolutely. Yeah, of course. Oh, yeah. So and, and that's a good point. Like, it's, I had to learn the style because we're making it up, and then we have to find the rules and why it works, and then be able to teach it, teach it to the animation team. And the same thing with effects and, and story and surfacing. I mean, everything was kind of brand new for us, so. Yeah, I, w I wondered about that because you t mentioned about uh, anime aspects in here and, and inventing the style. And the style has to work for visual effects too. It can't mm -hmm. pop up and look like something else. So you had to make those adap adaptations as well, didn't you? Yeah, so for lighting and texturing, you know, we were looking at, at how our art department worked. So we would go by their offices and show, show us how you made that image. And we'd see how they added line work and removed detail. And so a lot of those workflows were based around like, how do we get every artist to basically think and problem solve like an illustrator? 
And a lot of those were came from those early conversations before we were sent home, looking over Luke's shoulder, over Florian's shoulder, to see, like, when do you add the line work? When do you add that brush texture? Can we borrow those brush textures? And then we handed them out to everybody, built new workflows for almost every department to be able to add line work. JP's as well. Their department could add line work. Mm -hmm. On the motion side, you know, for crowds, character effects, and JP could talk about this too, effects, we always look at what animation's doing first to see how they're doing their posing, how they're doing their timing, and then clothing, hair, and effects all kind of take a leap from that. There's definitely some play back and forth to try to get some, um, you know, trying to find the best balance. But it was a challenge. I mean, yeah. uh, we don't have a lot of 2D effects animators at the studio anymore. Like, one of the only ones was our head of effects. And so we've got great effects animators, but they all had to learn how do we make every single effect look like it was done by a 2D effects animator. That says something about the educational systems. Yeah. Should start with 2D and then it was great. 3D. It, some, we, sometimes we work so hard to get a simulation to do something that would be now that we look back on it, why didn't I just, I could just draw it faster? Yeah. And now we have a whole team that could do that as well. That's, that's right. great. I have a couple more questions myself, but before I do that, in the back, if you have a question, I really can't see you, just come down in, be, uh, a little bit before the lights here and so I can see you. And we have a question over here right now. Go ahead, real loud. Hello. <laughs> This was not a question. This was this was a this was a fan. <laughs> you and I are gonna, gonna get along really well. You'll come down here. Thank you. They'll hug you and kiss you. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> it was the intent, really. Thank you for that. I have a, I have a, a, an interesting question. I, I hope an interesting. First of all, there's a two and a half minute opening scene. They're so just easy. talking, and then they go out into the and they're in a, in a cafe that looks like a norms or maybe uh, one of those kind of cafes that we're all familiar with. And then they go out into the sunlight and it's So I'm sure that was pretty interesting too. And it's all backlit and all that. But the, it sounds like, and it sounded like this way all the way through the film. It sounded like your actors were all in the same room doing, or on, on the same stage doing the play. They were, re a lot of times you, you watch a film and you say, whoa, that's a good, that's a really good performance. Oh, that's a really good performance too. This to me, looked like they were all doing it at the same time. And of course, they, might, uh, they probably weren't, but somehow they, there's so much back and forth. There's so much conversation back and forth. And there's so many reverses in the plot that it's, it's amazing. I, I, so how did you manage? Did they get in the same room? Yes, they did. There you go. Yeah, and that's a you know, good catch. It's, it's exactly the way we, we did it. We, um, from the beginning, the idea was to have that live action feeling, and also that cast is absolutely uh, uh, incredible. We, have, we are so lucky to have a cast like this, and, but they really wanted to iterate, but frankly, it came from us. It just We really wanted to get them to just pay off of each other, because when I feed the lines, it's not the same thing as when Sam Rockwell feeds the line to uh, Mark Maron, you know, mm -hmm. clearly, and, and we wanted that feeling of that naturalism, you know, and uh, so it's not easy to do it in a sound studio, but guess what? With pandemic, it helps because everybody's at home, and then you can record from Zoom, one from New York, the other one from Adelaide in uh, Australia, the third one in, uh, I don't know, Rome in uh, Italy, whatever. It, it works because 
they just need to log in, have their own sound, sound, sound booth, or sometimes from home. Or in their closet. On a closet, yeah, we've done that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it's horrible. Um, but uh, um, we've also done on an iPhone in a closet, and the sound is not great. But uh, um, they, they could easily do that now because we were all online. And so uh, it helped with that feeling of, um, you know, live action feeling or that at least for them, they could really feel like they were in a play, you know, and just playing off of each other and just really enjoying this. Um, and I think you're right. I mean, it helps with uh, how kind of a, uh, realistic uh, it feels and how the dialogue flows between them, you know. So we could write something that was a little bit more edgy also. You're going to have other directors looking at how you did this. Yeah, I mean, again, Zoom is a great tool. <laughs> Uh, and then I, I, I know I have a question here, and if anybody in the back has a question, please come down. We only have a few more minutes. There's a question over there. Oh, sorry, you'll, you'll be next. Because right there, we've got an unbelievably, unbelie are you going to ask the question? Go ahead. That's my son. <laughs> ah. Oh, uh, Luke, yeah. <laughs> so um, w you, you can repeat the question to the audience so they can hear Why'd it. I love you? Why did we <laughs> use this animation style instead of another animation style? <laughs> I didn't even understand my son's he, question. Yeah, he didn't understand. <laughs> Why did we not use what we usually bad, bad, bad. do before? Yeah. Great question. <laughs> and I'll see you at home. You'll see me. <laughs> um, Again, because DreamWorks has different house styles, we were able to just venture out and try different things. And you and I were a fan of the books really early on. And my son and I started reading the books every night. And we, it was every night. I was like, Papi, there's another book. And Papi, there's another book. And another one. And then the, what, what was great about the books is that the images were so graphic. They were ridiculous. And, <laughs> and they were funny. And it would make Lucas laugh when I was reading the books. And that's something that I didn't want to lose coming into the animation, I didn't want it to become like everything that we did before. I wanted to do something that really impacted and kind of honed in on what you were reacting to because, you know, those are the fans. Those are the, the, the people that are going to tell me and say, hey, we need to go see that movie. Lucas, you can ask your dad for anything right now and he'll give it to you. <laughs> uh, go ahead. Ocean Eleven. And there's Clooney jokes in there, too. This is a question about the Ocean's Eleven influence. Um, yeah, I mean, like, you know, of course, there's a massive influence from Soderbergh. Actually, the movie I used to start more, more like uh, out of sight than, uh, than Pulp Fiction, because, you know, this is also an homage to, you know, that first scene is an homage to Pulp Fiction. But he used to start with Wolf kind of walking in the, in the, in the bank, incredibly calm and charming, and just kind of seducing the teller to take him. <laughs> Um, so yeah, no, definitely, you know, we we're incredibly influenced by, by uh, Ocean Eleven and, and, and the, the, the dialogue in there and the humor that, that Soderbergh did and, and all of those twists and cons. And so that it really was intense from the beginning. Um, and, and of course, in order to, uh, to kind of support this, you know, the, the, the explosion in the outfits and the costume that, you know, I don't know. It like that's working. Yet. This one. I can talk while I'm talking. Okay. Um, was is a big part of that, you know, that 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 eleven members of the of the film. Uh, so Wolf is very much inspired by uh, Brad Pitt usually uh, for his for his outfit. You know, like we we used a, little, a lot of that. Actually, at some point we even had him kind of wear. We did so many iterations for his costume; it was really tricky. Um, um, and we ended up in the simplest one, by the way. You know, white and just uh, he's he's dark with. Those yellow eyes, super iconic and simple. But we, we we did so many tests and so many different variants. At some point, we were even tested like kind of a little bit of a, a Tyler Durden style, you know, from uh, the Fight Club. And he was looking so cool, but he was a leather bit jacket. Leather yeah. jacket. He was he was pretty pretty great, but a bit less less iconic in a way. Um, and uh, and and Snake, yeah, definitely. There is some Andrew Thompson from uh, Fear and Loathing in Vegas, and also. Um, and I always blank out on his, on his name. Um, the guy with the big glasses and the, the, the other casino owner um, that sides up with Clooney and, and Brad Pitt. You know, ah, what's his name? Elliot Saul. Uh, no, not Saul. Elliot Gould. Elliot Gould. Elliot yes, Gould. Elliot Gould. Thank you so much. Yeah. So it's the blend of these two kind of a... But it, it's been there from the very beginning. Actually, 
when I saw the first, uh, when I saw the book for the first time, that Damon, uh, who's over there, producer right there, and Rebecca, uh, Damon had that book on his uh, on his uh, on his desk, and uh, the first thing I did because I, I kind of read the the script and just did a quick sketch of these characters because I was like, oh my god, this is amazing. Already on that sketch, which is four years ago probably at least, the the design of Snake is basically what you see here, like like the same yellow glasses and the little uh, bucket hat and the Hawaiian shirt. So yeah. There you go. Very much inspired. Uh, we only have time for one more question, uh, and, and oh, we have, and there it is. There, there she is in the back. There you go. Go ahead, really loud. That's a great question. Go ahead. Uh, if you, uh, uh, what were the challenges that we had to do in animation, and how the characters would have to interact with each other? Um, it's it's actually a really good question because at the very beginning uh, in pre-production, you know, from animation, I love I love acting, I love performance, and a big part of animation that I wanted to maintain and bring in is the believability that the characters are a family, that they've been in, they've known each other for years, and many conversations at the beginning, and you gave me a packet that you guys were working on. It's like, oh, Wolf and Snake are a mom and dad, and these are the kids, and it was like. Oh, that that makes sense, you know. And Tarantula became the older, uh, the teenage girl, and then Shark, and then Piranha. And uh, as a as a performer and in, in, in animation, you also have to know their 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 kind of their their communications between each other. If Wolf leaves, what's the dynamic like? If Wolf and Snake leave, what's the dynamic between Tarantula, Shark, and Wolf, the three kids? And we're like, well, if Tarantula needs to babysit, she would just put on her headphones and let them fight and not care. And we knew that going in. So it, it's teaching the animators, because they're, they're performers, is figuring out what the dynamics are. And you know, Piranha, you'll see, and there's a lot of hidden little things in the background in this movie, where Piranha is the last person to know what's going on. He has no idea, no clue. And you'll see him, everyone's like, oh my god. And, and he's just like, yeah. Oh! And then it just cuts. And he's always in the back. And those are things that the animators brought in, because they just knew who the characters were. And so a lot of it was, building these characters from the ground up and, and, and personality-wise. And we had a great acting coach, Alan uh, Simpson, that came in and he was uh, kind of really helping us ask the right questions for you to answer and, and gave us all the tools that we needed in order to make the scene, like let's say in the car, very believable, like how they see each other. That was a long answer, I hope that. That was a good answer. <laughs> uh, um, and uh, and, and th with that, that'll be the last question. But before we go, I want to thank Universal, and I especially I want to thank you guys, Pierre, <laughs> JP, <laughs> Catherine, Matt. Thank you all. Thanks, Frank. Thank you. thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you.